Welcome everyone. Time to get started. We'll be in Hebrews chapter 12 tonight. Two more chapters in our short course on Hebrews. <clears throat> Looks like a quiet crowd tonight. Long day? Rough at work? Okay, chapter 12, and the key topic tonight, we're going to be comparing uh, experience at Mount Sinai for the Israelites versus our experience in coming to the Lord at Mount Zion, the spiritual Mount Zion. So that's going to be one of our focus areas for tonight. And as we've been talking about, and it's going to be part of our theme as well tonight, is for our obligation and opportunity for us to exhort one another daily while it's called the day to make sure that we're all staying on the right path following the Lord and not regressing. So that's another part of what we'll be talking about tonight. So uh, last time for me at least, a quick overview of the outline of Hebrews that we've been through. And uh, we talked about him being the better mes messenger, Jesus, and better than, almost, angels. There we go. There's a lot of betters here, so it's, it's gonna run together, right? But in chronological order of the chapters, Yes, he's better than angels or the prophets. And the better apostle, better than Moses, of course. Yes, so. And then the better priest, Jesus was better than whom? Melchizedek and the high priest under the old law. Better covenant, this is a gimme. The new covenant is better than the no brainer Old co covenant, yes. And then uh, we talked about the better sacrifice, Jesus. Why was he a better sacrifice? Better than what? Better than animals, and why he was sacrificed once for all time. Take care of both past, present, and future, as we talked about. Mike talked about the better way last week, the way of faith, and the summary comments that we had about faith were that it's the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So, as we gear up for our promise, of the spiritual promise that we have, the better way of faith gets us there, as opposed to what we had under the old law. And finally, uh, we got this quick, quick summary of what we covered last week in Hebrews 11. Uh, again, that verse there, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, just to kick off the chapter. Then we had some nice phrasing there that we understand that the worlds were not framed by the word of God and the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. Very nice corollary set of statements as we've been going through the book of Genesis on Sunday mornings, and we talked about the creation events. This is certainly supplementing that quite well and how our faith leads into this of how we know that the things that were mentioned in Genesis were done by God and made out of things that were not visible. Then we had the uh, Sorry, I was just afraid that was my phone. <laughs> I'm looking over. Uh, we have the story of Abel, Enoch, Noam, Abraham, Sarah, and what they went through in the summary verses right after that, say, having seen the promises afar off, they were assured by them, by faith, embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. And after that, we had a long list of people from the Old Testament, everyone from Isaac all the way through David, through the prophets, and everything that they went through there. And the summary verses after that said, all these, having obtained a good testimony through faith, did not receive the promise. God provided something better for us that they should not be made perfect apart from us. So we're all looking forward to this promise now, the spiritual promise. They were looking forward to it by faith even back then. Of course, that's the foundation of what we have today under Jesus, faith in him and the better life that we will have eternally following this. So any other remaining comments, questions from the book of uh, our chapter 11 from Hebrews? Mike, anything else we covered? Okay. Because as we wrap up that quick little summary, the first word that we're going to read in chapter 12, and I'll just read the first two verses, therefore, so because of everything that we just talked about in chapter 11, everything we covered last week with Mike, therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has set down at the right hand of the throne of God. So just a few comments there, very important introductory passage, transition passage, actually, from the discussion of faith into now, how we're going to be leading our Christian life. 
And just to recap, we're talking about in the book of Hebrews, Hebrew Christians that were being tempted or drawn back into Judaism. And so there's been a uh, 10 chapters, basically, of highly uh, logical writing that shows why the better way is to follow Christ and remain there versus going back to where they were before. And we're going to make this transition now that we're through chapter 11 into how we should be living going forward as Christians. And so the points here that are really salient, I guess, after we have read everything about faith and how it should be the driving force in our life, lay aside every weight and sin and run the race with endurance. So we make that transition from all the logic we've been talking about into this second level, which is the, uh, the pleading and the exhortation that also comes in the book. And so the last couple of chapters here are really going to be encouraging us about how to live the right life. Uh, hopefully we've put aside the need to discuss going backwards. Don't need to do that. And if we're going to keep going forwards, here's how we need to be living. So he says, lay aside every weight and sin and how to run the race with endurance. So it's going to take some effort, time uh, to get us there. But that's what we're being called to do. And I like this. Uh, that we're supposed to look carefully unless anyone falls short of God's grace. And we're going to get to that in the middle of the chapter. And then finally, as we wrap up chapter 12, you have not come to Mount Sinai, but to Mount Zion. So we'll be doing some comparisons there. But if we keep those three points in mind, and Brian, as we were talking before class, also talked about the, the discipline that we have with God and how if we are his children, we will have that discipline. That is weaving into this as well. But all of this is making sure that we lay aside the weights, that we look carefully, and that we make sure that we're focused on the spiritual hope that we have in Mount Zion and not looking backwards to what was in Mount Sinai. So, first two verses we already read. So the key things there are, like we said, therefore, because of everything we said, let's lay aside every weight and sin and run the race. We're surrounded by examples of faith. I think that's such a neat thing. So I've never met Abraham, Isaac, David, any of those people mentioned there. And yet he says we are surrounded by them in our life because we can read about them and we know what their life was all about and how their faith kept them focused on a future promise just like we should as well. So we're surrounded by this example and it should help motivate our lives as well. And he also says that we should look to Jesus, our ultimate example. And there's a lot we can dissect in this, and we've got plenty of time for discussion tonight, so feel free to chime in. But we look to him as our example of faith and look at how he endured the cross, the shame that went with the cross, the crucifixion that he underwent, all for us. And why? It says, so he could achieve the joy set before him and sit at the right hand of God. So he knew what was coming. He was here to do what on this earth? What Jesus' purpose. Make sure it happened, right? He, he had a mission, right? What else? I heard something else. Fulfill prophecy and scripture, right? And we talked about, where's our legal guys? Back in the corner, Doug. So what, what's that clause when a, a contract is good until a certain point and it transitions? to a, a death. <laughs> Contingency clause, right? So all this is valid until this happens. And so we keep referring back to Deuteronomy 18. Moses said, there will be another prophet, and when he comes, you listen to him. That's the exit clause from the Old Testament. And so Jesus, as we talked about, was the better apostle, the one that we have to listen to now. And so literally, he fulfilled the prophecies that were written about him, both in terms of what he had to do, what he would undergo, what it meant for the people. But legally, he was the contingency clause. Did I get that right, Doug? of the Old Testament, that this was the point where the old law is now fulfilled. We've already talked about in Hebrews, it says it's annulled, it's done, it's finished, and now we're moving forward. So he fulfilled all of that, and that's why he was here for us, so that we can have the hope that we have, our sins are remitted, that's the sacrifice that we talked about, it's done once for all. And for himself, it says, obviously, that there was a joy before him as he was going to be seated at his father's right hand, that exaltation that we've read about before. So all this comes together in Jesus as our ultimate example and what should keep us motivated to keep moving in the right direction. Uh, comment? Yes. This is not probably central to the meaning or the most important point of the text, but something that is just on my mind that seemed to be applicable. Um, for whatever reason, that joy of the Lord is my strength song has been stuck in my head. 
And, um, and I was just thinking about the words to that song, like, how, how does the joy of the Lord make you strong? And, it, you know, it's the hope, you know, and then, and, you know, well, I guess there's lots of ways, you know, but I was just kind of pondering that. And I uh, read this verse and it says, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. And, and so I was like, oh, there it is. You know, um, he endured it because he, 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 he had strength knowing the joy that, that was going to become, I guess, uh, that would happen when everything was done. Um, it, it, it appears that it's worded that way. Anywho, I never thought about it in, in this when I read it before, but just thought I'd share that thought. Yeah, it, to me, it's a beautiful picture that Jesus, and re remember how he prayed in Gethsemane. This was a painful experience. He asked that it could be removed if, if it was God's will. It wasn't, and he endured it. At the same time, he knew what was on the other side. He knew where he would be restored to in heaven, sitting at the right hand of God, exalted there. So he knew that. So hopefully for us, we see that too, that no matter what we're facing, and we're going to talk about trials that can uh, affect us coming up in the middle of the chapter, but if our faith is in place, and again, we've got that cloud of witnesses from chapter 11. If our faith remains here and we have faith in that hope here that we know is coming, just like Jesus did, it can help us get through these trials that are coming. So that's just the thought that, that comes out of that. Oh, go ahead, Brian. <clears throat> How would the, I can pick on one word that we're talking, talk about one word that we've talked about in chapter 11 and now in chapter 12, and that's the word witness. A witness in, in a legal trial now is a person, an honest person, who gives firsthand testimony to that which they've experienced, observed, and so forth. And on the, on the testimony of an honest witness, a whole case can turn on uh, innocent or guilt. So what we have here is an entire cloud of witnesses who suffered up to deaths and gruesome deaths and, and adversity because they knew something firsthand that they observed witness experience and that which they suffered is our, our testimony. And so we can look at the first century martyrs. We can look at the apostles. By the way, the apostles are witnesses, not of the things in heaven, but of that which they were told by Jesus himself and the Holy Spirit. And by the way, Jesus and the Holy Spirit are also called witnesses, and they are witnesses of what they've seen in, in heaven. So now we can look, why should we have faith? Why should we have confidence in our salvation? Because of this great cloud of people who suffered so much remained faithful because they knew of God and they knew of uh, the heavenly things. And therefore, we can too. Right. Very good point. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, we talked about the carrot and stick passages that we saw in Hebrews, and that was back in chapter 10, I guess. So how, are, how would you describe this writing so far? Carrot or stick or something else? Carrot? Carrot. There's, a, there's something good for us out there, and then there's going to be a little bit of how to, how to put this out. So you've seen the pictures of the donkey with the carrot out here, and he's trying to grab it, and it can never get there. But from time to time, he needs a little pushing. So I think we got both things going on here. So we are encouraging, you know, push, endure, keep going. But there's a carrot out there. Keep driving us forward. Just a weird analogy, but that's what popped in my head. We're going to see that as we go through this. There's going to be a lot of pushing and encouraging to keep going to get to this carrot. Go ahead, Albert. Endure, and I just took a dive on my phone about the, the word, and for right or wrong, I've, I've envisioned endurance as far as physical stamina, which is a part of it, but it's really interesting that, to me, it's interesting, patiently, steadfastly, not being swerved. And so when I look at run the race with endurance, it's you're going to have trials, tribulations, but it's keeping a hold of the prize and patiently getting through that and in times of good giving thanks and in times of bad giving thanks but it just it's really interesting that the endurance for so long I've, I've seen it as just a physical stamina but when you look at the definition patience and steadfast is so intertwined in that word that it, it really is helping me reflect on why some of the names were referenced in the chapter before and then what i'm to be doing today uh, you know, I, versus the, the stamina part. Right. 
So it sounds almost like a mental thing than a physical thing. Endurance, keeping mentally in the game, steadfastness, things like that. Okay, let's see. Oops, is that the last comment? That went by pretty quick. You know, the comments on those first two verses, that sets the stage for the rest of the chapter. So we've got uh, verses 3 to 11, and we need a reader. And guess who's got the microphone? And a deep voice that everyone can hear. Thanks, Michael. Hebrews 12, verse 3 through 11. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself, so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet re resisted to the point of shedding your blood, and you have forgotten the exhortation that addresses you. And have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline, in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Besides this, we have, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time, as it seemed best to them. But he disciplines us for our good, that we may share his holiness. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant. But later, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Yeah, Michael. <clears throat> so a few um, key points here, and we'll open it up for discussion here on the set of verses. So obviously, don't become weary or discouraged. This is the pumping up side. This is making sure we're staying on the right uh, path here. As Albert said, this is part of the endurance that we're going through. Don't let yourselves get bogged down. So even Jesus suffered this hostility from sinners, and obviously unjustly. We know everything that he went through. So again, as we're looking to him as our ultimate example, even he went through these things. It's not above our job to be called to do those same kind of things as we're looking to him as an example. And this verse, yours read a little bit differently, uh, Michael, but I think it captured the essence of what we're going to get to. So uh, he tells the Hebrews, guess what, guys? Even though you may be going through some trials, you haven't resisted to bloodshed in your fight against, it's supposed to be against sin. So what, what does that bring to your mind when you hear, you haven't resisted the bloodshed yet? What, what are you thinking? Right. And then that great cloud. And what they went through, right? The cloud of witnesses going through everything they did. And, uh, well, you moved away. Sorry, Michael. I was going to have you read your translation again. I'll just jump into what this lexicon say about this particular word. A bloody death. <clears throat> Life passing away in bloodshed by force. To the point of shedding blood. To the point of death. So you get the idea that if you're undergoing those kind of trials to bloodshed, that means you are being forcibly killed, shedding your blood in the process. And the point again to the Hebrews is, you haven't been asked to do that yet. Yes, you're undergoing some trials, but it's not that bad yet. Not as bad as what Jesus went through for us, our ultimate example. So again, if that's, that's you know, what Jesus did, and that's the example, you're not even having to do that yet. So endure. Keep going. Maintain yourself. Don't, don't let it fall, uh, pull you away. And back in chapter 10, we read this verse in uh, verses 32-33, but recall the former days in which after you were illuminated or spiritually enlightened, became Christians, you endured a great struggle with sufferings, partly while you uh, were made a spectacle both by reproaches and tribulations, and partly while you became companions of those who were so treated. So there was some evidence there in chapter 10 that they were going through some trials, but again, as he says in chapter 12, not unto bloodshed yet. No one's, you know, been forced to die yet because of what you're going through. So you're going to get through this. And look at those cloud of witnesses and what they endured as well. And we're encouraged to remember that while we're going through these trials, that we don't forget that the Lord chastens who? Whom he loves. And so if we are loved by the Lord, we will be undergoing some chastening. And there's a quote there from Proverbs chapter 3. 
If there is no chastening, you are, ooh, this is harsh, illegitimate and not son. Now, does that ever make you think that if our life is too cush and everything is just hunky-dory all the time and there's no tribulation, does it ever make you wonder about this verse? Are we being chastised? Are we being the example that we should we? Are we letting our light shine like it should be? Are we taking stands where we should be? And yeah, we're going to endure some persecutions and trials as a result, but that's part of the chastening. Look also at 2 Timothy 3 and 12. This, this is a common verse that we read, and it says, everyone that would live godly will do what? Suffer persecution. Okay, so if we're desiring to live a godly life, and we're standing out like we should, and we're being separate like we should, some things are going to befall us. And it's all part of the chastening that builds our faith, builds our endurance, builds our obedience, if you will, and lets our light shine that much brighter before others as, as we're doing these things. So that's important for them to remember. You haven't had to do, do this unto bloodshed yet, meaning your own death, but you have had to endure some things, and that's because God is chastening you, and you're trying to live a godly life, and it's going to be a natural outfall of that. Any comments about that one? Pretty self-evident. Go ahead, Ryan. How would you say that you're going to discipline? Right. He uses the word discipline. He uses the word discipline, which I, I'd have to look up the word, but I think it means to teach, if mm -hmm. you will. Um, and so if you, as we talked about before class, if you think you're suffering the discipline of the Lord, you are very blessed because God is chastening you for the purpose of perfecting you and developing you and giving you wisdom and yielding the fruit of righteousness. Right. Good point. So we'll keep going through this. Even our earthly fathers disciplined us. So here's an analogy. So we've been making all these analogies back to the old law and showing how the new law is better. Now he makes an analogy to our earthly fathers that if they disciplined us to make us better, to keep us on the right path, to encourage us to do the right things, shouldn't we now accept the discipline of our Lord and God? It's just a natural follow on, that if we're willing to accept that physically, let's be willing to do that spiritually as well. And I love that, that we're in a subjection to the Father of Spirits. So again, the spiritual aspects of this, not just the physical. Oops, sorry. by too fast. The Lord chastens us so we may partake of His holiness. There's a purpose there. It's not just for fun. It's not just because He likes discipline or things like that. It's for a purpose that we may partake of His holiness. It grooms us. It makes us better as we go through the process. And I like the way he sums it up. It's painful for now, for sure. But at the end, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness. So the outcome is what we have to keep focused on. Just like we saw in Jesus. He saw the joy. He saw the exaltation and was able to make it through that. For us, the same thing. We can make it through this trial, uh, these uh, discipline that we're facing, so to speak, because we know we're going to get to the Peaceable fruit of righteousness. Now, we've been studying in Genesis, and so as I was reading this this week, it made me think how we've been talking about Joseph and everything that he went through. And he went through a lot. And I, I know in the past, it's like, oh, okay, okay, he made it, no problem, because he got to a really good place. But remember that verse that said, when his brothers were thinking that he might punish them, what did they say about the look on Joseph's face when they threw him in the pit? Anguish. Remember? He was. He was torn up. This was not a good thing. This was not an easy trial. And so he went through this, but at the end, he could see God working through this to make sure that Israel, that family, would be preserved and they would be able to thrive just according to, uh, to God's promises. Same thing for us today. At the end of all of this, we'll get to that peaceable fruit of righteousness if we'll just endure and don't let our faith waver. Comments, questions? Michael. Um. Something that comes to mind with uh, the word discipline, and I, I think it's meant in this text, is uh, training. Uh, um, like, you know, self-discipline is a form of training. Like, you train yourself to do something. Like, you're disciplined. You, you, you do it. You, you know, have a structure in place or, like, you practice it. Um, and, and if the Lord's disciplining you, he's training you. You know, and then yeah, he's training you how to, how to be righteous. He's training you how to be the, the man or woman that he wants you to be. Um, so I just thought I'd throw that in there too. 
Yep, good point. Anyone else? Okay, we're going to make it to the next set of verses here. Okay, 12 through 17, can we get a volunteer to read? I'll pick on you. Don't make me do that, okay? Thanks, Jordan. Appreciate that. Okay, verse 12. Therefore, lift your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be put out of joint but rather be healed. Strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by it may become defiled, that no one is sexually immoral or unholy like Esau, who sold his birthright for a single meal. For you know that afterward, when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no chance to repent, though he sought it with tears. Okay. Hey, thanks, Lord. We get a couple of points here. I, this is my summary. If you read this now, there's that word, therefore, again, because of everything we've just said, man up. It's time to gird up your loins. It's time to get serious. It's time to get the job done. So again, carrot stick plus the encouragement. We're definitely in encouraging mode here to make sure we're staying on the path. What does he tell them? Strengthen your hands, knees, and feet. Okay. Again, you're, you're going to build yourself up and get ready for this. Don't be dislocated. And I, I read one... Uh, a lexicon that said this means to be basically turned out of the way, but be healed. Okay, and so as we're following a path, if you, according to this lexicon, the context would be I'm following a path, but if I get dislocated, that means I'm pushed out, I'm going another direction, the way I'm not supposed to go. But in this case, it says, don't you be dislocated, keep following the path, and be healed as a result of all of this. Pursue peace and holiness with all people without which no one will see the Lord. So again, we're getting into this Christian living aspect. So if we're making this decision not to turn back, we're going to keep going forward. Let's make sure that we're girding ourselves up. And this is the way we need to live in front of all people with peace and holiness. And he says, look carefully unless anyone falls short of God's grace. Now, when you read that, what's your sense of that? Is that, and I, let me be clear about that. Do you think that means each and every one of us needs to look internally that we don't fall short of God's grace? Or do you see it as an element that we are looking out for each other to make sure that we're helping others not fall short of God's grace? Or both? Brian says both. Right. So the looking carefully to me, I, I can see that applying definitely internally, but also as we're helping to help one another stay on this right path. Don't let bitterness spring up and cause trouble. Boy, anyone see bitterness cause problems within the church? Okay, there's a couple of yeses here. Yes, don't like to see that, but here's the admonition. Don't, don't let that happen. And he says, don't be a fornicator or like Esau, who he called a profane person. Now, David and Doug have been tearing this one apart over the last few Sundays here, and I think this was you, uh, Doug, that had everything that happened to Esau. But there was an interesting set of things that happened to him. What happened to his birthright? Was that stolen from him? Okay, so did he willingly give up his birthright? Okay, that was his choice. I think, right, Doug? He, he gave that up. Now, was there deception later with the blessing of uh, Isaac? There was. But at this particular point, Esau profaned his birthright, made it a common thing, nothing special. I'm willing to give it up for this stew of lentils. Don't do that. Here we have this faith that's in front of us. And if we start turning backwards, in the Hebrews case, to the old law, or as us today as Christians, to start deviating, to be dislocated and following the world, what are we doing with our birthright, our spiritual birthright? We're throwing it away. Exactly. We're doing the exact same thing that Esau was doing. We're going to give it away just for something that appeals to us in the flesh. Now, the, to me, the saddest line of this particular set of verses is this next one. When he sought repentance and the blessing, it wasn't available. And what does it say? Though he sought it diligently with tears. Oh, does that not break your heart? 
Sounds like Judas. He realized too late what happened. Esau realized too late. Judas realized too late. The, uh, the parable we have of the rich man and Lazarus, way too late for the rich man. But he realizes what happened to him. So as we're looking at these encouragements for the Hebrew brethren and for us to stay the path, this is something that just really stands out. There will come a time when it's too late. And there's always time to repent as long as we're alive. And God will listen to our repentance if we fully turn and he's ready to forgive. But there will come a time, and it says, death and the judgment, right? And at that point, it's locked and loaded. And we don't want to end up like Esau or like the rich man or like anyone else found in that situation that we realize too late that we can't recover from something that we've done. That's a pretty sobering thought to me. Stand out to anyone else? Am I the, I'm getting kind of sappy in my old age that this is really, and it sounds pretty sad to me that he's just weeping and he can't get, what he's already given away. Albert? In context, it would have struck home to the audience that it was being addressed to. It would have had a, a lot, but to apply it to me today when I see sold his birthright for one morsel of food is I gave up on my goal of heaven to for the pleasures of this world. Right. You know, and and then the weeping is is uh, when I realize it, it's it's too late, you know, which I'm staying in judgment, but I just, to me, application is I give up heaven for this world. And Paul addresses apostle or uh, disciples who left him having loved this world and, and that sad aspect of it. So uh, I, I need to be there for myself and I need to be there for others to, so they don't make the same mistake. Exactly. So if I take this one to be the look carefully internally, that, that's how I would take this one. And then the next thing that comes to mind is we talked in chapter 3, exhort one another daily. We talked in chapter 10, stir up one another. Here's the aspect of us looking carefully for others and helping them to stay on the path. So all of this, to me, kind of fits together, both internal and uh, with, within the group and us looking out for each other to keep that exhortation going and to follow up with helping one another. Okay. Next set of verses here, unless there's any other comments, questions on that one. Uh, Jeremy. Oh, you're going to volunteer to read? Okay, go ahead, Michael. Do you have a comment? Um, just one thought about, um, well, okay. No, it's leaving. I'm like losing the thought. <laughs> um, I was thinking about uh, the judgment. You know, yes, when you pass away, you know, you'll be judged after you die, or if Christ returns before you die, um, then, you know, those who are, you know, that, that would be the end too. Um, and I guess I was just thinking about like how someone might think like, oh, well, I can just wait till I'm probably closer to dying and then I'll, I'll make right. And it's like, well, but we, I think we've covered in some previous classes, you know, like today or now is the time to, to make your path straight because you don't know how much time you have left, whether you know you could pass away today or tomorrow, or, or whether Christ returns at any, who knows when, right? Like a thief in the night. Um, we don't know when that will be. So I just wanted to make that point. No, good point, Michael. And uh, just a, a flash ahead back to our recent revelation study. What, what happens outside the wall of the holy city? Who's out there? People that are weeping and wailing, realizing that they're not gonna be inside such a sad thing. It really is. But this is the encouragement that we've been given to the, the Hebrews and to us as well. So Jeremy, go ahead if you don't mind. Next set of verses. Sure. Uh, for you have not come to what may be touched, a blazing fire and darkness and gloom and a tempest and the sound of a trumpet and the voice whose words made of the hearers beg that no further messages be spoken to them. For they could not endure the order that was given. If even a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned. Indeed, so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I tremble with fear. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God and heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels and in fest festival gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn who enrolled in heaven, and to God and judge of all, and the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. 
Great. Thanks, Jeremy. Appreciate that. And a few more points here. The contrast, like we talked about at the beginning of class. Zion, or Sinai, which the children of Israel came to, their experience there versus what we are seeing in our experience with spiritual Mount Zion. So how is that different? Well, what happened at Sinai? Pleasant experience for everyone or not? Terrifying, Terrifying experience. Not so much. And in fact, I, I love it. Hey, uh, Moses, you go. We're going to stand over here because we're not sure we can handle this. And uh, that's what ends up happening. And we talked about everything you see up here. Blackness, darkness, tempest, begging not to speak to them. It was that terrifying. Can you imagine? Even Moses himself was exceedingly afraid and trembling. So that's the, the picture. And these Hebrews would have been well aware of that from the scriptures of, of what the Israelites are going through back there. Now contrast that to what we come to in Zion, the city of the living God. Oh, what a comfort there. We made it home. It's the living God. And that's where we're going, Mount Zion here, the heavenly Jerusalem. And look at all these beautiful things that we read about in this passage that we're going to find there. Innumerable angels. Oh, that, that's going to be quite a sight, isn't it? There's just angels, angels, angels. If you pick up on re revelations and try and picture that in your mind, it's just almost impossible. But here's all these innumerable angels. The general assembly of the firstborn. I love that picture. So here's the congregation of everyone from Christ through everyone that's been saved through his blessing, his shed blood, having been Christians and have made it through that, we have this whole general assembly there. We got God right there, the judge of all, and the spirits of just men that were made perfect. Another beautiful phrase. And then Jesus, of course, our mediator. Sitting where? Right hand of God. Doing what for us? Making intercession as our mediator. Again, that beautiful picture that we've got right now, and we're going to see that fulfilled. But that's the contrast. Here's what the Israelites went through physically, scared them to death. But here's what we've got to look for. This beautiful picture called Mount Zion, spiritually, that's waiting for us if we endure, if we live up to everything that we've seen here in chapter 12, and we maintain the path. So, any other thoughts, comments about this, Brian? I would, this is an extremely important set of verses. Because you read it in context with the revelations and also uh, verse 28, since we receive a kingdom. So what we have in three verses here is a description of what's in the kingdom of heaven. What's in the kingdom of God? What is, is in the kingdom that we will inherit? And so you see the angels, you see the Mount Zion, you see the holy city of Jerusalem, you see the church, you see God, you see Christ, you see righteous men. That's the kingdom that we receive for verse 28. Yep. I mean, it's just a beautiful picture. I keep it in front of us every day. If you could clip that out and put it on your refrigerator. But I, I can't get my mental image on the refrigerator. It just doesn't work. I can put the words there, but I, anyway. And that last the verse there in uh, verse, where are we, 24. We're coming to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. What are we told about the blood of Abel? Even, it, what's that? It cries, out. it cries out, even when it happened. Back there in Genesis, God said it cries out from the ground. And it's something that we remember, uh, the testimony of Abel. And this uh, we have as the better blood, if you will, another better from Jesus the meteor that has been sprinkled <clears throat> upon us. Okay. I think we're going to make this. I'm going to read the last set of verses here. Uh, speed reading. Sorry. Hang on. Here we go. Verse 25, see that you do not refuse him who speaks, for if they did not escape who refused him who spoke on earth, much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him who speaks from heaven, whose voice then shook the earth, but now he has promised, saying, yet once more I shake not only the earth, but also heaven. Now this, yet once more, indicates the removal of those things that are being shaken, as of things that are made, that the things which cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore. Since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. For our God is a consuming fire. So this final set of exhortation about how they should be living moving forward as a Christian, despite the discipline, the persecutions, the things they're facing, keep that image in front of them of what they're striving for, the joy that will be obtained, and 
how we need to be viewing this <clears throat> and paying attention to the heavenly voice that we're listening to now. But don't refuse him that speaks, that is God. Why? Can you escape God? Someone dial up Jonah real quick. Okay. Did, did he escape? Didn't make it, did he? Everyone that's tried to escape, not working. You won't escape either. He shook the earth. Now he also shakes heaven, a much more stout thing, if you will. He removes the things that are shaken, that it is the earthly, that the things that cannot be shaken may remain the heavenly. And as a result of all this, we're going to receive a kingdom that cannot be shaken. So as a result of this, in our life on this earth, let us have grace. Let us serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. Why? Our God is a consuming fire. And we read about consuming, and it is utterly, totally, it's all gone. You remember back in Ezekiel, we talked about the four types of locusts that popped up. And one of them was the consuming locust. What was left after the consuming locust? Not a whole lot, because they consumed everything. And so here's the analogy to God being a consuming fire. There's no place you can hide. We need to listen to his voice. And let's stay away from, this may be the stick part of the verses, this consuming fire so we can keep the joy in front of us. Don't regress. Keep going forward. Endure. So, anything else on this set of verses? Hopefully we get this picture here of how he's trying to encourage these Hebrew brethren, having gone through all the proof points about why the new covenant, why Jesus is better. Let's keep going. Let's keep faith in mind. Chapter 11. And let's serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. So I think we talked about this. We haven't resisted the bloodshed. We talked about that. Are we going to face the point where we have to resist the bloodshed? Potentially. Did you see it happen? <clears throat> Do we read about Christians suffering? Somewhere. Somewhere, right? <clears throat> China's a bad place right now, right? Middle yeah, East. All kinds of places where Christians that stand up for their faith or become discovered for their faith are going to endure unto bloodshed. It, yes, that's right, there too. It could happen to us, we don't know. But the Hebrews hadn't gotten there yet. We haven't either. But we still are going to face trials and tribulations if we're going to live godly and if we're going to be serving God. So that's the point. Here, that we've got to make sure that we are maintaining, even if we're not going to get to the point of bloodshed. Uh, we talked about this, I think, enough. Uh, and then our God is a consuming fire. I, again, this is another terrifying thing. Just like when Esau realized it was too late, when the rich man realized it was too late. And we realize that our God is a consuming fire and it could be too late. There's not going to be mercy. There's not going to be grace. There's not going to be things that can save us at that time when it's too late. And again, you, you like the, uh, the carrot stick thing. That's a pretty big stick to keep that in mind. But if we're keeping our life focused and living a godly and reverent life, that keeps us on this avenue of love, looking at the joy, not just thinking about what's over here if we don't obey. I don't know what's the, the stronger motivator. I think you need both at times. You need to be scared witless, literally, that this could await you if you're not going to be obedient to God. At the same time, you need to be filled with joy and awe of what could be waiting for us when we do live faithfully over here. I like the carrot a lot. But from time to time, just like we have here in chapter 12, you've got to be reminded of the stick. Exactly. It, it, God did that for a reason, right? Because you need the proper motivation. So hopefully that made sense. Hopefully we see now we've turned the, the, the tide here from proof points, the chapter of faith, chapter 11, to now here's how we need to be living. And then Mike's going to wrap up next week with chapter 13, which is more of godly living for the Christians. So here's the, whoops, we've been through this. Never mind. Uh, next week, chapter 13 is the reading, uh, plus Joshua 1, 5 through 9, Psalms 118, verse 6. And you're going to touch on a, a quick review of Hebrews next week? Okay. So be ready to have the highlights in mind there. Last minute questions, comments? Yeah, I think we got one minute to go. Maybe even not that. Thank you very much. Appreciate it.